Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And I am joined today by a bit of a Silicon Valley legend, a CEO multiple times over. He doesn't have the ego to tell you he's a legend, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. And we're going to learn from Evan Kaplan. Now, before I welcome Evan to the show, let me just tell you briefly about his background because it's, it's as good as they get. Uh, Evan is the CEO of Influx Data, a fast-growing 130-person company based in the Bay Area. Before that, in addition to uh, some time in venture capital, he was the CEO of iPass. He was the CEO of Aventail and so on and so on and so on. So he has made all the mistakes and he's made all the right decisions when it comes to people and he's going to share these with us over the next 20 minutes. So with all that said, welcome to the show, Evan. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Mostly I, mostly mistakes, just so we're clear. <laughs> mostly mistakes. You and me both. And did I understand you also climbed the Himalayas? Yeah, yeah. So you're Hello. a pretty, pretty fearless, fearless dude. Why don't we start with, uh, well, let's start with Influx Data, just because that's what you're up to these days. You've been there about three and a half years. Um, just in 60 seconds, tell us a little about the business and the size and scope and, and what you do and maybe in layman's terms, because it's a, it's a pretty interesting technology. Yeah, sure. So we're, we, as you said, we're based in San Francisco, about 130 people. We're a classic Silicon Valley venture funded startup. Um, what we do is we build a platform for handling time series data, which sounds really archaic, but it's not really. It's really metrics and events, any kind of measurements at scale. And so where that comes in, comes into use is in IoT, sensor data that's yep. coming off of everything from self-driving cars to industrial to energy and also off of so the new software stacks. And so really it's about a platform that collects instrumentation data, processes it, and applies machine learning to it. So I assume it's a lot of data, right? Coming it's from a lot data. of data. A lot of data. It's hundreds of millions of points a second is the way to think about it. Jesus. And what, what would be an example of an analysis that you might be doing on an autonomous car or a computerized refrigerator? Pick, pick an example just so people <laughs> understand. Yeah, so an easy one to understand is, is um, Nest for um, their home smoke alarms and detectors, collecting all that information about temperature and um, carbon monoxide levels and things like that. That kind of stuff gets stored in influx and processed in there. Tesla for their new power wall batteries. So those are instrumented with influx so that tells you how much energy you're collecting, over what period of time, what season, all that. Anything to do with instrumenting stuff over a period of time. Which is obviously, a category on the rise. So influx yes. hopefully has yeah, a bright it's future. A, yeah, it's the fastest growing category in the whole data market. So Love, it. About it. Love yeah. it. So before we continue to geek out, let's talk about the people part of this because obviously influx data is built up with people. You said about 130, 140 folks. Um, and, and how many? And hiring. Are, so and hiring fast. So Great. So if you're interested, get people get, know. Get in touch, right? Exactly. Um, these are what computer science AI folks primarily, or what? What do you typically hire? Well, so you know, it's a mix of any go-to-market company. So probably half of our folks are deeply technical folks, database people, big data people, DevOps infrastructure people. So software engineers, um, AI folks, ML folks, people like that. Got it. So that, and then normal sales and go-to-market people. Got it. And I think you said about a third of them are local in the Bay Area and then two thirds are elsewhere. Where All the world. All just liter world. literally distributed everywhere. Yeah, we've taken, partly because my partner and our founder, Paul Dix, he lives in Brooklyn. I live out here. And so we have a remote first culture and that's really important to us. So we'll hire people wherever they are. So we have people in Italy, we have people a few people in London, a bunch of people in New York and Denver, Idaho, Salt Lake. Um, yeah, so we just have, so we have, we're willing to hire people all over the world. So maybe that's a good place to start with kind of drilling into it. How do you build a remote first culture? Was that the term remote first? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but specifically, how do you build a culture, right? It's hard enough to build a culture, a healthy, vibrant culture in one place. I've tried and failed many times. 
how do you do that at scale remotely? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that, that, um, that, have been, that have been important in that journey. One is we do something that's very unique um, that I'm not aware of any other company doing is we have a daily stand up every single day at 9.30 West Coast time. So our European team can be there and it goes no more than nine minutes. One either executive or team leader reports every single day. It's three to four minutes. There's usually some announcements. There's usually some jokes. There's a word of the day and then we're off. And just so I'm clear, Evan, this is you and your direct team? No, it's the whole company. The whole company? Everybody. So everybody. most of them are listening, obviously. They're not all participating uh, verbally. Yeah, but, yeah, but some, uh, you know, some of the time the meeting's run by a person remotely. Sometimes it's run by somebody in San Francisco. It's very rarely run by an executive. So a little bit of planning, a little bit of planning goes into it each day? Like no. Someone's... No. No, you step up. There's a, anybody can run a meeting. It wow. happens at 9.30 every day. There's a little agenda for every meeting. It can't go more than nine minutes. And we're on and off. And what's nice is you literally see everybody. And so if there's an inside joke, it's not inside to San Francisco. If there's a funny thing to say, people can get it. You see what people's home offices look like. You have the classic, yeah. you know, 100 people on a Brady Bunch screen. You right. have people who are reporting or full screen. It's just... It's not the content that matters. It's actually just being there. It's the process more yes. than the specific agenda. And yeah. this, is, this is every day for nine minutes. Why, why nine minutes? Because uh, you don't want it to be an interrupt in the day. And you want it to be very quick. And so just nine minutes is arbitrary. Got it. Um, but you, you can start feeling like if it goes more than nine minutes, people start getting anxious. Or like, yeah, oh, I'm sure, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're like, because you and just get a habit forming. This is via Zoom video? Yeah. So, so that's one of the things, yeah. So that's one of the things that's really been important in our culture. The second thing is, is we use Zoom, but there are other tools, obviously. You know, every meeting is assumed to have a Zoom component. And so most meetings have somebody from, you know, from not local in San Francisco there. And a lot of meetings have nobody in San Francisco there. Right. And so just knowing that and the Slack infrastructure and the normal stuff of a tech company days. And then the third thing really has to do with culture. So I joined the company um, when it was only 22 people. And with those 22 people, we, we, um, we built a value statement that wasn't something that I dictated, but it was something that organically came. I asked those people and I broke them up into three small groups. And I said, what do you love about being here today? And what do you feel like you need to be successful? And from that, after like eight or 10, you know, sort of ruminations and re-editing, we developed our value statement. And it's been the same, I don't imagine it changing over the period of time. And that helps form because when people join, it's one of the interview criteria. Right. right? Fit that value, they fit those value statements. They believe in it. Without and going, it, without going, go ahead. oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, and I think the important thing is I have to be held accountable to that. And so I invite everybody to hold me accountable for it. And, you know, occasionally I've had to apologize or things where I thought like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm wrong. This was, that was not the way to handle this situation. So that kind of transparency, that, that flattening of the organization, super important. So I'm sure the listeners would love to understand how you operationalize that. Because you mentioned, Evan, that you actually interview for culture fit as much as you interview for competencies and skills. What's one value? We don't have to go through all of them, but pick one and then help us understand how do you interview for that? Because a lot of people I think really struggle with interviewing for the soft stuff to put it in quotes. So what's one example? So one of our, you know, one of our, one of our values is around humility. Humility is the foundation of learning the belief that you don't, your cup is never full, that you're constantly trying to figure out, um, you know, useful things, useful ways to be in the world, useful ways to be in the company and things like that. And so when we interview people, we're looking for that. So arrogance doesn't play very well. It's not to say that arrogant people can't be successful. We just don't find it that useful, right? Um, and so so that's, a, that's one of the ways it plays. We also have... Um, what I like to call one asshole policy. A lot of companies have a no asshole policy. 
ours is a one asshole. So my team tells me I'm the one asshole. And so, <laughs> and so, and so by having the one asshole policy, you're, you know, you kind of, you know, you're at least making a statement about it. So. Which means if you find someone who's an asshole, who's so good, you want to hire him or her, you got to go. That means I got to be way nicer than I am today. That's, that's true. So, no, but in general, we just, you know, like life's too short to work with people who, you know, who are just, you know, who are either malicious or yeah. are, you know, all about themselves. So no, or, pr no prima donnas. You, if someone we has do everything we can to avoid prima donnas. They have the that's perfect, absolutely. perfect skill, the perfect background, the perfect education. You will decline. Yeah. Would look like. Wow. Well, un unequivocally, it would be hard for me. I couldn't even push somebody through who, who would. it just wouldn't work. While we're on the topic, maybe just for the listeners, describe your recruiting process. Just at a high level, what are the key steps? Do you, uh, is it interview based? How many interviews? Who interviews? Is it via Zoom? Yeah, or I don't person? think we yeah, I don't think there's any magic there for us. You know, we do a normal selection of interviews, obviously values, somebody interviews. We're getting better and better at parsing out the interviews and making sure that people are asking different components so that we're not repeating. Yep. My own style is that, and sort of known for this, is I really want to hear somebody tell their personal narrative. You know, I want to know sort of everything about how they got there, what their high school experience was like. I just want to really understand the fabric of the person. That tends to be my thing. And what does that help um, you understand, Evan? I just get one is when they're on board, it helps me have more fulsome experience. When I, when I listen to people, I say, oh yeah, that comes from that experience. But even before it tells me that, you know, it tells me who they are as people, how they show up in the world, which is, and, and the most important to me is are they authentic, right? You know, um, and so I'm looking for that kind of stuff. So I, I like it here. I also like to hear how people tell stories. I also, there's way more surface area for me to remember stuff with stories than there is with random sets of, of information. I'm so, sure you're pretty good at remembering information. You run a data company, a time series data company. Well, that's why I don't remember it. It's all in the data. It's all <laughs> in the database. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what else do you do, if anything, beyond interviews? Is there any part of the process that's unique or any part that, you've incorporated that you find to be useful? I don't know that we do. I don't know that we do anything magical around the interviews, except try to get a, try to get a point of view by all the interviewees. We share the data, obviously we document it, all those sorts of things. I think we do a good job of enrolling people. So, you know, it's sort of my job to frame where we're going as a company and, and how they fit and where people's role are. And I think my, you know, my fundamental belief about people in organizations is they're successful if they feel powerful some way, shape, or form. Yep. And they're incrementally, everybody's better at the edge if they know where the whole thing is going. And so, it's, you know, if you, if you do, if, you're, if you feel powerful, you're part of something bigger than yourself, right? And you know where the ship is going. You know, that's, that covers nine-tenths of job satisfaction. Yep. In my point, it is for me, so I assume it's true for most other people. And, and the no asshole rule actually helps because there's no mid-level managers who are assholes. And right, they don't get, you don't get it. They're accountable the way we are. Yeah. We have the one asshole rule. I just yeah, the one asshole, sorry, one asshole rule. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you parted ways with people? But let me, let me reframe that. What are some non-performance reasons you've parted ways with people? And it doesn't have to be just in your, in your current company yeah so you parted ways because uh, you know i part ways probably you know probably the least common way but the most annoying way is when um people create divisions mm -hmm. and so sometimes you don't get that in the interview process in which they want to optimize their subsystem and so something i say to my direct reports is you know, 80% of your time is running your function, but 20% of your time is running the company. And so the optimizing of any specific subsystem in favor of the optimizer of the whole system is problematic. And so people who create divisions, who can't figure out how to work across the table, who can't figure out that, that's the, that's the thing that just drives me nuts because it's not, it's not a thing I want to spend my time on, right? Well, there's no, you don't have time, time to spend on it. I mean, it's just not, it's right. not feasible, right? But if it's not happening, you may have to make time, right? So when you, you have to have people go. When you find that you've hired someone like that, whether you want to call them a shitster or non-collaborative or whatever it is, 
do a, can a few conversations change it or have you generally concluded that they somehow got past this interview process where you admittedly looked for values and you just missed something and, and they need to go? It's a great question. I'm trying to think back. You know, sometimes, sometimes, and I wouldn't say it's the majority of times, you get a person who's got, culture shouldn't mean homogeneity. And so you get a person whose style is just different, right? It doesn't mean they're malicious. It doesn't mean they're purposely trying to create divisions. Their style is just different. And so I found sometimes when you can work with people and you can work with the rest of the team for everybody, and you can even make lighthearted of different things, that that, that, that can come back into the fold. Um, and so if it's a stylized difference, often you know that coming in and you're willing to make that bet. Right. Um, but, but, but it's not just the person. It's also the team has to respond. The team isn't something static. That's really important. Every new executive changes the team. Every new player changes the respective team they're on. Do you ever get the team together in per the entire team together in person? Yeah. Once a year we get a whole company together in person. You know, we do the classic, we, we rent a hotel, a hotel we run yep. a two-day event, we do some fun stuff. It's really actually important. It's a very when, significant when, investment, obviously. They're flying from around the world. Yeah, it is a significant investment. And we encourage, I don't know that we save money by being remote first, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm sure we really don't. It's just access to talent, um, probably, right? Yeah, just we get access, and particularly we're an open source platform, and so getting the best open source developers can be anywhere in the world. Um, being open to that is great. And I used to be, you know, I, mean, I used to be the kind of person that if you didn't see people in seats, then you were afraid nothing was happening. And I have a very different feel for it now. I really What do. changed? I it's, it's, it takes a lot to admit that, Evan. And I really appreciate that because we've all worked with people who are FaceTime people, if you will. What, sure. When did the light go on for you that that doesn't work anymore? Um, I think part is me just getting older and sort of seeing like, you know, like, okay, there are different ways people execute and that sort of stuff. But I think once the whole culture rotates around remote first, then the level of accountability for remote people is different. Yeah. And so you have high visibility, what people are doing. And I think the tools are so much better than they were, say, 10 years ago. You know, Zoom is a relatively, and Blue Jeans are relatively easy platforms to work with and, you know. It's just not hard to create that kind of accountability. Yeah, you really couldn't do it five, ten years ago. And it's not that I even have to see it. I think my view has changed. Like, okay, we're hiring people who know how to get work done. And so I'm going to assume they, have, they, they get work done. And that's it. Yeah. Some of it's just a fundamental assumption. If you're hiring good people, they're going to make stuff happen. And that's well, part give, of our values, too. So. Yep. I give you a ton of credit, Evan. You, you've done this multiple times. You make it look easy. And... Uh, and I really appreciate yeah. sharing your, your wisdom with us. How can people learn more about Influx Data or get in touch with you? Um, pretty easy. So um, my Twitter feed is at Evan Kaplan. Uh, my LinkedIn profile is an easy way to get in touch with me. And then Influx Data is www.influxdata.com. And we're looking for talented developers. We're looking for talented salespeople. Um, and, anywhere um, anywhere globally, people. right? Anywhere globally. <laughs> anywhere globally. That really um, opens up the funnel. Yeah, and if this is an appealing mission for you, it's kind of a deeply technical product. So yep. you got to kind of love that stuff. But, uh, yep. but like you said at the yeah. onset, this, this category is booming. So you're at, the right, you're at the right place at the right time. And there's a company here, and it's not, I'm really, it's not, I'm not much accountable for it, that has some gravitas. There's a real culture here that has a sense of commitment to each other and, and um, a commitment to values that we're, we're building something that has some legs to it. Not just a good product market fit. So. Great. Well, Evan, thanks again for making the time and sharing your uh, experience with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Great job. Thank you.